Welcome to the Startup Grind. Well, thank you all everyone for coming. We're going to interview Kat Gordon, who owns Muddy's Bake Shop, and talk about starting up, being an entrepreneur, and a lot of good stuff. We'll do an interview for about 30 minutes or so, and then we'll break into question and answer. So start writing down your hard-hitting questions for that. Kat, you yeah. want to talk a little bit about Muddy's Bake Shop? Yeah, well, I was going to say, if we're going to introduce our illustrious interviewer as well, your credentials, um, don't know if who knows here, we have Eat Local Memphis here. Um, and the, I think the full disclosure, Eat Local Memphis and Muddy's Bake Shop are a couple. So, so if anybody was wondering, yeah. <laughs> so this could, go, this could either go really well or really poorly. <laughs> yes, yes. So what, what was your first question? Well, tell, just before we get started with the questions, why don't you tell us a little bit about Muddy's in case someone here has never been there? Uh, Muddy's is a maker and purveyor of delicious sort of home style baked goods. So we do the range of pies, cookies, cakes, cupcakes, um, pretty much the comfort food, what you want to have with you for a celebration and also what you want to comfort yourself with at maybe the end of a bad day. We sort of meet that whole range uh, here in Memphis. So Memphis born and raised. All right. Before you started Muddy's, you were a real estate agent. Yes. Tell us a little bit about the transition from working for someone else into being an entrepreneur. Well, I'll definitely to preface that with saying I was a pretty bad real estate agent. Uh, there were aspects of it I really enjoyed, but there were some that I was just not that great at at all. Um, being a real estate agent actually was really good preparation. Um, all through college, I worked for for someone else, so in various people's retail stores, that kind of thing. And then actually the real estate career was a little bit of a transition because you you certainly have guidance and expectations, but you're also a little bit, I mean, you are an independent contractor, so you're also running your own business. So while I wasn't great at being a realtor, it did give me some preparation uh, simply for you know, managing my own time. So how did you know that you wanted to run your own business and operate your own deal? Well, like I said, I was pretty bad at real estate. Uh, so did need to do something else that was only going to last for a certain amount of time. You can only be terrible at something that's 100% commission based for so long uh, before a change needs to happen. But I think a lot of it was you know, thinking about what I might like to do. And a big part of it for me personally was simply getting a handle on my wants versus my needs um, and figuring out that I might could take a risk to do something that, you know, I thought might not be monetarily successful. You know, what was sort of my base level that I needed to earn simply to exist in a way that was acceptable. Um, so that was definitely part of the decision making process. And a lot of it too was simply uh, a happy accident. Um, it was, the baking was something I did as a hobby. Um, it was something I did to avoid real estate. <laughs> um, it was my procrastination tool and luckily it was apparently good enough that some other people wanted to eat some of it and you know essentially pay me for my time and ingredients which was mostly you know family and friends to start with. Uh, so I was able to sort of get a foot in the door that way and in some ways I thought haha test out what it might really be like to have a bakery. Um, that was super naive but that was sort of the beginning transition. Let's talk about the beginning. So the name of this event is Startup Grind. And I remember the beginning of Muddy's as both a startup and a grind. <laughs> let's, let's talk about the part of the business before you ever open the doors to customers because that behind the scenes work is really important into getting mm -hmm. something started. Tell, tell everybody a little bit about what went on. Okay, so between the moment of deciding to actually pursue this business and opening the doors, uh, very much like a researcher. So my educational background, for those of you that don't know, is English literature and art history. No business, <laughs> no culinary experience. So in the months leading up to actually opening the business, I really took um, a lot of advantage of the public library. I 
think they got to know me on a first name basis um, on the second floor. Um, the small business section, I checked out about every book possible, um, opening a restaurant, opening a bakery, every business book imaginable, um, brushing up on, I'd taken accounting 101 and 102 in college, so brushing up on that. Um, there was, I mean, Thomas remembers, stacks upon stacks of books, constantly going through the rotation, coming back, keeping notebooks. Um, I knew enough to know that I knew absolutely nothing. So the, the leading up stages, you know, I think what people tend to think about is, oh, dreaming up really great recipes and, you know, having fun that way. And there certainly was that aspect, but there was a lot of learning and attempting to fill in the gaps of my own knowledge. And I'm incredibly thankful for that. If I remember correctly, a lot of what you were studying was how to avoid the pitfalls that would lead to failure. Yes pretty confident this was going to fail and my goal was simply to make that happen later rather than sooner. So you went from effectively a research student who learned everything about opening a business to then mm -hmm. opening a business on Leap Day 2008. Yes. Tell us about opening the business and what transpired after that and how your role changed pretty dramatically. That's a great question. My role did change very dramatically. Um, so going from the research stage opening the doors. Um, yeah, I think some of you have probably been around for the life of the business. So that's almost six years ago. Yes, it was leap day. I had not processed that it was leap day until about halfway through the day and was reminded that, uh, oh, you can only celebrate a birthday every four years. Ha ha, isn't that funny? I'm like, oh, crud, this is already just insane. Um, but then really went, you know, like Thomas said, anticipating anticipating failure and that's just to be super super honest I was really this is a huge leap of faith as a business and like I said I had absolutely no experience doing this I had no education there were no reasons that this should have succeeded um, so I kind of felt like my job was to minimize the damage that was surely gonna befall me um, and so not expecting that first day we hadn't even told anybody we were opening so not expecting to have a big crowd the first day, I was surprised. Um, we had a lot of people the first day and then a lot of people the second day and the third day. Um, had family members constantly on call that were dropping everything that they had to come in, help me out. And um, you know, Thomas would take off work early, mom and dad, my brothers, all of that was going on. So it was a real gear shift going from Am I going to be standing naked on Poplar Avenue holding up a sign like, please come to my bakery versus, oh my God, what do I do with all of these people? I don't have enough food. Um, so my role really went from researcher to uh, survival. There was a good point where I was the primary baker and the primary customer service person, um, you know, pretty much there about 20 hours a day for months on end. And that's just hanging on, that's riding that line. And then sort of as the business grew a little bit, able to hire some more people, I really had to adjust to becoming a manager, which I'd never been before. A little piece of trivia, I have never been promoted. I've never gotten a promotion, <laughs> ever, <laughs> except for myself. And I'm not really sure that that 100% counts. Um, so really trying to learn on the fly and really counted a lot on you know, input from my family, but also input from employees, from what they needed from me. So I feel like my role, I would love to feel like I was very in control of those shifts, but I felt very reactionary. I was reacting to what the business needed. And it's great, I've talked to, you know, I'm 32, a lot of my friends have had children at this point. And the friends I've talked to who have had babies I feel like there are a lot of parallels to that, you know, feeling all of a sudden like they exist to sort of meet the needs of this other thing that they don't know how to do it. They don't know what they're doing. It didn't come with a guidebook. I mean, there are lots of books published on how to run a business. I read a lot of them, but it, it all seemed irrelevant at the moment. Um, so really adjusting to that role of just how do I take care of this? What do I need to learn? And then, you know, we're coming into year we're about to be six years old now, so. So what's your role? What is your, describe your role now, as opposed to what it was then. A lot more strategic thinking, a lot more long-term. 
I can't get away anymore with only looking towards the next week or the next month. Uh, my employees need stability. Um, there are more expectations. So I think right now I've really been trying over the last year to adjust to a new role, of letting go of some of the minutia of the day to day, which any of you type A eldest children might know is incredibly difficult to do. Um, so yeah, this last year has been really, I've been trying to focus on growing professionally and being what is what the business needs me to be, which is more a long-term visionary um, and training a really kick-ass management team. So I think we're probably, we're probably talking to some entrepreneurs here. And if you could get in a time machine, and go back to 2008, and give yourself a few pieces of advice from future cat, what would you have told um, startup cat? Wow. Um, be not afraid, first thing. Um, but after that, probably, probably to chill out just a little bit. Um, everything, everything seemed like the biggest deal ever at that moment. And looking back, I think I was probably super selfish. Um, I would probably tell myself not to be quite so convinced that every small problem I was having was this huge dramatic moment that was maybe the end of the world. It felt like it at the time. And, you know, all of you who have pulled all-nighters, all that kind of thing, when you're also hungry and really tired, it's really easy for small things to appear to be gigantic obstacles. So I'd probably reassure 2008 Cat that, you know, not everything was this super high drama moment. Um, I would also have advised her to think less about what are you going to do when this fails and a little bit more about putting in some pieces that would help me in case it was successful. Let's talk about that. Um, a lot of people prepare for potential failures. It's really mm -hmm. easy to imagine what some of those failures could be or to be prepped to react to those. Talk a little bit about the difficulties that can come with success and the things that you don't expect that came with really quick success in your case. Right, and that definitely, um, for starters, you don't really feel like you can talk about it because you feel like a real jerk in the middle of a recession being like, oh my gosh, I don't know what I'm gonna do with all these customers. I mean, that just really is a jerk move. Um, but in that moment, that was the story right there. We were not prepared for that many customers. And that is a real issue for what are you going to do when two-thirds of the people walking through your door you're having to look at and disappoint and say, we don't have, we don't have what you came in for. Um, we're open for eight more hours today, and we're already out of almost all of our food. Um, that is a very real problem at that moment. So I would definitely say, again, with the kind of take a chill pill, step back from it, um, trusting a little bit more. Um, I had a great team starting out. I think that's one of the things I've had the whole time. Wherever we've been in our growth process, my team has been super fantastic. I think I maybe should have trusted them a little bit more, um, been a little bit less controlling about every detail, and looked a little bit ahead. Um, I remember my mom describing, you know, describing it as a kid running a bicycle down the street. And it's like, okay, if you have the bicycle, you just need to get on, on the bike and you're gonna be able to go a lot faster. So basic things, just like hiring more help was a huge issue. Um, so being able to sort of handle, you know, what if it is really successful from the get-go, I think in the planning stage, we focus a little bit more on the failure because it's what we're really afraid of. But being sure to take a moment to say, okay, what am I gonna do if this is wildly successful. What's, what's my strategy there? And just to have some sort of idea, because I think if I had done that, I would have felt at least more confident, even if I didn't use that plan, that there was a plan in place. So just kind of something to think about. Think about what's the worst thing that could happen, and then what is the absolute best thing that could happen that might actually cause problems? And just maybe a, a three-step, okay, if that, if that happens, here's, you know, here's kind of how I plan to handle it. I think that would be helpful. Well, you mentioned people. Let's talk about it. I'm going to ask you a couple questions about the people in the business. 
Um, the first is talk about the difference in hiring when you were hiring while you were a startup versus when you were hiring as a more established strategic business later down the road. Okay, so hiring as a startup. I had made my first hires before we opened, obviously. And I was basing that on the idea that we were going to have very little business. But, you know, focusing a lot, the basics of that haven't changed, actually. Right at the get-go, I think I was really looking for attitude and enthusiasm. Uh, it's a very service-based business. So, in my opinion, you know, you can teach a lot of things, which we really weren't, by the way. There was no training program. It was like, sink or swim, here you go. Like, grab a spatula and jump in there. If you can't figure this out, then we were going to find out the hard way. Um, but, yeah, really looking for that enthusiasm. Is this somebody who likes people? Because uh, that's what I really wanted to build was a business, you know, a place where people could come and even if they never purchased an item, still feel welcome. Uh, so I think people are a really big part of that and really looked for that enthusiasm and that welcoming attitude. And that has definitely continued to this day. But, I mean, I remember some of those early interviews after the, you know, three weeks that we had been in business with, more customers at that point than I thought we were going to have in the first, you know, six months of business. And I can barely remember those interviews because they were, I mean, they were taking place on easily 30 minutes of sleep. Um, you know, it seems like a little bit of a haze. I think at that point, part of me was just looking for who's going to show up, who has the schedule that I need, who's going to at least pretend to answer my questions in a semi-professional way. Um, you know, everybody has stories about some of the answers they've gotten. I still remember one. I mean, I think I almost started crying in the middle of a job interview because I was so exhausted. And this young woman had come in, and one of my questions, and is to this day, um, are you good at smiling when you don't feel like it? I think it's a fair question. And most people get that one right. It's a yes or no question. There's a clear right answer. Um, and I remember this person looked right at me and said, mm, on a good day, I really bring it. If I'm having a bad day, I'm a little bit of a fun sucker. <laughs> and I just remember, I mean, I still remember how I felt. I was so tired. And I'm sitting there looking at her thinking, did this really just happen? I'm so tired. Can I just end this right now gracefully? What do I do? And I finished the interview. Um, but yeah, I remember some things like that. And she actually even clarified to me, because I think I sat there looking shell-shocked. And I remember she kind of leaned forward like, to define what a fun sucker was. Like, you know, sucks the fun out of a room. I'm like, nope, I, I got it. Like, that's <laughs> fantastic. Thank you. Um, so there, was, there were the, definitely those moments. But then there were just, I mean, there were people... There was a girl that is still with me when she's in town. She's a part-timer, and she travels with farms. And she was one of my first hires after we opened. She was in high school at the time. And now she's been doing college long distance while interning with farms. And, you know, I think about how her interview went, and it was so much of just like, well, when are you available? And I know your youth director. He thinks you're pretty cool. Um, and she's now there's definitely – She was fantastic at customer service, Yes. And you know now there is more of a process, but I think the basics are the same. Well, let's talk about let's talk about people in terms of growth. Um, everyone here has probably baked a cake before, I imagine, or baked something. So we can kind of imagine what it would take to go from baking three dozen cupcakes to three hundred or five hundred or whatever that number is. Or three thousand. Three thousand <laughs> and. You know, you could kind of extrapolate more ovens, more flour, more eggs, more pans, more people. So you can make more product. We can imagine that. How do you keep the business, the core values and the culture of the business the same as what your goal was when you started when now you have 26, 27 people in the company? I think a lot comes down to trust. Um, you know, talking earlier about how my role has changed. You know, one of the most difficult things for me has been, I went from being part of a team of seven, where, I mean, you work with six other people intimately, you know, booty to booty in a tiny space. You get to know each other really, really well. 
Um, and I loved that community aspect. I loved knowing my coworkers that well and them knowing me. And that has been one of the challenges as we grow. Um, certainly for me personally, you know, with, with 26 people on the team, you have a human threshold of people that you can spend that kind of time with and that you can know really well. And 26 is well beyond that threshold. Uh, so it has been an adjustment for me to sort of have to accept that, all right, what is my team? My team is my managers. And those are the people that I'm probably going to be able to have that level of intimacy with. And then they, in turn, need to have that with their team. And that's been a difficult transition. But I think, again, being able to pick really good people who really care about the people that they're working with, I think you maintain that feel. And we also make a point to do a lot together. Um, it's really tough, but we have, our, you know, we have our monthly team meetings. We have things outside of work that are 100% optional. Um, but we try to make sure that we take time to get together. And I think that, that really fosters that team environment. Also, with two separate locations, you know, we have an off-site kitchen. We also have uh, the shop on Sanderlin that has an on-site kitchen there. Um, it can be very easy with different shifts, different locations, to get into a little bit of an us versus them. You know, obviously so-and-so messed this up. It was their problem, not ours. And that's with any workplace, anywhere. And I think we've really deliberately tried to counteract that by having, for one thing, our bakers rotate through Sanderlin. Um, so everybody, you know, all of the bakers spend some time with the customer service people and in the shop. Uh, we also make it part of training that your first week of training, before you're even really getting to the nitty gritty of what you are going to be doing, no matter what job you're coming into, you spend doing the circuit. So you do a couple customer service shifts, you do a couple of baking shifts, you get to sort of see all those components so you have a real appreciation for what your teammates are doing, even if your teammates are across the city and working at 4 a.m. where you normally work at 3 p.m. And I think that's really helped us to maintain that sense of camaraderie um, and just unity around a goal. Is that a little of the Jack Stack methodology of business? A little bit. You know I love my Jack Stack. <laughs> yeah. So people again, sometimes you have people that turn to you when they have questions. Mm -hmm. It's hard, I imagine, to turn to them when you have some questions. So talk a little bit about the importance of mentors, how you find one, what you look for, how, how you interact with them in a way that, you know, as an entrepreneur, you know the ones you want are probably similar to you and that they are very busy and they have a lot going on. How do you make that relationship work? That's a great question. I am all about the mentors. I feel like I have got a huge list and my heroes and mentors definitely tend to overlap. Um, the first sort of piece of advice that I have there is definitely seeking mentors outside your industry. So most of the people that I have that I consider my mentors are not bakers. Um, and it's fascinating to me that there are still so many overlapping issues. You know, we all work with people. And really when it comes down to it, I feel like that's where most, most of the questions come, most of the anxiety come. Things that are in your specific skill set, you usually know the answer. You know what to do or you know where to find it. I mean, that's why Google exists. You can just search for the answer. You know, baking powder or baking soda. Okay, this is going to be a five-minute question. Um, it's really the questions about relationships, I think, that most of us have trouble with and want some outside advice for. And I feel like it's going to be a lot easier to develop those relationships with people that are not your competitors. Um, so my mentor list certainly does consist of some other bakery owners. Um, I try to find those outside our region. Um, so I have my bakery best friends in Vermont and Nashville and Savannah. Um, those are people, you know, they're not interested in nationally franchising, just like me. So we do not consider each other competitors at all. So you definitely can get good advice. So those are people I turn to for questions about like a seasonal special or something that we're doing that might be baking specific. Uh, but the majority of my mentors, as I have come to realize that most of my job is not related to my product when it really comes down to it. My job, my primary goal as the business owner is to keep my team healthy so that they can do their job and take care of those details. And that's something, I mean, one of my uh, business best friends has a funeral home 
in East Tennessee. And you would be amazed with the amount of crossover there is between a bakery owner and a funeral home director with these same issues that are going on. Um, a pizza place in Colorado, definitely my friends up at Zing Train. I mean, Maggie and Ari are fantastic up at Zingerman's. So really searching out those people in separate industries. And then same thing locally, you know, finding those people locally that you really admire how they do business because you can have those frank and honest conversations at that point without worrying about, am I giving away a trade secret? Am I, you know, talking too much about a promotion we have coming up? You know, at that point, it doesn't matter. They don't care what you're doing with your product. You don't really care what they're doing with theirs. You want to be able to talk, you know, business owner to business owner. Is that? Yeah, that's okay. right. <laughs> Memphis has a reputation of being a community that gives. Muddy's has the same reputation. Talk about the importance of giving back, how you do that, and why you have made that one of your values. It definitely is one of our values. And I feel like in so many ways, the Memphis community was super generous with me and with Muddy's when we got started. So describing a little bit about, you know, how the business started and being sold out hours before closing time. Um, I think there are some communities that that would be completely unacceptable. People would have easily, you know, taken to the internet with bitter diatribes. And Memphis is just the kind of place that instead just surrounds people with encouragement and lifts people up. And so that certainly made a huge impact for me at a point where I'm getting half an hour of sleep every night. Believe me, it didn't take a lot to like maybe just burst into tears over anything. Um, so having that kind of support was huge. So on a personal level, I mean, that just meant so much. But also, I just think that Memphis, like you said, Memphis is a giving city. I think what we're number two per number capita, two. number two in the country uh, per capita for giving. So part of it, I mean, I'm, Memphis born and raised, it must just be, must just be in the water here. Uh, but one of the ways that we have really done that, I kind of feel like we haven't done enough over the last few years. Um, I think in a lot of ways, plenty of businesses here give tons and are super involved with the community. I mean, anybody here who has a business, you have probably been approached for innumerable gift cards or donations, or if you have a food business, constantly approached about making donations of food for various nonprofit galas and silent auctions, things like that. And there are plenty of places that give and give and give, and I'm not sure that Muddy's has really done more than those places. Um, I think we're just very deliberate about it. Um, more excitingly, we have really made a commitment the last year, we have a new, a new internal program coming about. And this is actually, um, you know, talking about growth of the team and growth of leadership opportunities within Muddy's. Uh, one of our former customer service people uh, left us for a year to go teach and we stayed in touch and just kept talking and she was really driven to start something. She really missed being at the bakery. She missed the service aspect uh, but didn't want to come back and just do more of that. And she really had an experience with, you know, with nonprofit, with volunteerism. And she approached me with an idea that was just like, you know what, I feel like this is where Muddy's is going. This fits with the guiding principles what would you think about doing something along the lines of uh, paid volunteering for the staff? Because we've really tried to get staff involved with the outreach things. So like we have our community jar. We don't accept tips. Um, there's a jar next to the register and every month there's a new nonprofit. And the staff have been directly involved with that. I mean, they choose who it's gonna be. People can submit nominations, but it's ultimately the staff's choice to vote on who's featured. So Sarah was saying like this would play into that and so now, starting this month, uh, we are partnering with th three different nonprofits in town and really honing our dollars on those things, trying to make a real, a real difference beyond the gift card here, the gift card there. Um, so I think that's going to be a real game changer. And again, it, it will benefit us too in tying into the leadership opportunities that staff have. I mean, studies have shown time and time again that people who volunteer are healthier, are happier, you know, have more opportunities, um, are more confident. So I think it's a win-win for the community and for us. And do you feel like that is going to, this program being a part of what you do is going to help you find better people to work for you? Absolutely. I think it's going to make us more competitive as a workplace, at least for the kind of employee that we're looking for. We are all about service at Muddy's, and I think the kind of person who's really 
into providing great customer service is probably the same kind of person who's going to be jazzed about the opportunity to spend a paid hour and a half working with a local nonprofit every week. I, I think that's theory right now. It's not really proven. I'm hoping to be able to come back in a year and say, yes, we proved it. It was exactly like we guessed. <laughs> Tell us a little bit. You've mentioned crying a number of times. <laughs> And I'm really not a weeper. And it's I remember, just when I'm tired or hungry. I've seen a few of these tears. Let's <laughs> tell about something embarrassing that's happened at the bakery and how you overcome that kind of situation. That okay. It seemed like life and death. Okay. I realize this is going to be on the internet, but I am still going to confess the single most embarrassing thing that's ever happened to me in the history of Redding Muddies. Um, and that is when I called a woman a stalker. I don't know who she is. I've never had the chance to like come back to her later. I did apologize at the time, but to lay out the scene. Um, 26 year old, small business owner, completely unprepared for what's ahead of her. And like we have established, a lot of success is wonderful, has its own really interesting problems that come along with it. One of those being absolutely no sleep whatsoever, sometimes for days at a time. So what had happened was we ran out of stickers for our bakery boxes and I ordered, I ordered more and had not realized they sent me the proof. It's not the sticker company's fault. Um, I think I just missed it. And had they had my home number on our stickers to go on all of our bakery boxes. Um, and I did not even notice it. I mean, it was our home, home phone number. And, um, I don't even know how long they were there um, before someone called from the box, which I felt most people found it online or something, but this poor, poor woman uh, was looking at her bakery box and called the bakery number and uh, got me at home and I had just come back. I mean, I think I had just spent maybe a solid 48 hours at the bakery and just arrived home thinking, okay, I have enough time for maybe a shower and a quick nap before turning around and going right back to my business. And the phone rang and I answered it and it was somebody with, you know, some inane question about the bakery. And what proceeded was a really sinister Laurel and Hardy exchange of how did you get this number? And she's like, it's on your bakery box. I'm like, uh, no, it is not on my bakery box. Like, this is my home number. We're unlisted. How did you find this? And of course, I can just picture now this poor woman at her house thinking like, this is a crazy woman. Who am I talking to? What kind of professional business is this? And the answer was she was talking to an incredibly sleep deprived, crazy woman um, who had just missed this detail. And I mean, I, I did eventually realize what had happened. And I mean, I, I was, as, I didn't call her a stalker, but I was essentially accusing her of somehow finding my home number and tracking me down at home, because obviously that's what people would do. Um, and yeah, I think it was after I'd had my shower and my nap, kind of started thinking, like, well, that would be really weird. I mean, why would somebody do that? And uh, as soon as I got back to the bakery, sure enough, checked the boxes and just had this moment. I mean, I, I think I could feel the blood just filling my face um, and felt so incredibly awful and did call her and apologized. I, I don't think she accepted my apology, which I <laughs> can't say I really blame her. Um, but that is one of those moments. You can't go back and fix it. Um, I still feel bad about it to this day. But I do think um, anyone who has started their small business already probably had a moment very similar. Um, and anyone who is going to be starting your small business, don't worry, yours is coming. <laughs> Can't wait to hear your story. <laughs> so one last question, and then we're going to turn it over to the audience to ask some questions. So on that note, you see online, I guess it's really popular, zombies are popular. And so you can find zombie survival kits online all over the place. Okay. Machete, gun, bottle of water. Mm -hmm. What would be in your entrepreneur survival kit that you would provide to the up and comer who's just about to get started? A machete, for sure. No, <laughs> um, not really. Okay, I would probably go with a subscription to Inc. Magazine. I think that is the best $10 you can spend in a year. Um, 
I was not paid to say that, but if they want to give me presents, um, I'll accept them. Um, all right, so the subscription to Inc. Some sort of to-do list or productivity manager that works for you. Um, I designed my very own to-do list template. If anybody wants it, I'm happy to email it to you. I just made it in Microsoft Word. But um, I do well with a finite list because if I have a large piece of paper, I will fill that piece of paper of things I need to do that day, which just ends the day feeling incredibly unaccomplished and really terrible about myself. So mine has places to check off for the type A who likes to check things. Um, so I would say whether that works for you, if that works for you, I'll send it to you. But whatever it is, find some sort of time management productivity tool that works with your personality type. That's my thing number two. And thing number three would be a stash of stress food. So probably some cheddar and sour cream potato chips and a bottle of wine. That counts as one item. All right. They go well, together. Well, that sounds good. I'm gonna let's turn it over to the audience for questions. Um, if you ask a question, I'll repeat the question so that we can get it on the video, oh, okay. and then we'll let Kat go. I want to know how um, how you got the funding to start your magician. How did you get the funding to start your little business? See, I totally already forgot the directions. Um, I was just gonna start answering. Um, Personal savings, I will say that is not going to be an option for everyone. Uh, my business looked super cute with some hand-painted salvage tables and items of furniture from my own home. Depending on the business you're going to be starting, that might not be an option. Um, so I would say for the other option, maybe visit your SBA. Um, we do have a small business associate. Small Business Association here in Memphis. They have a lot of great resources. Um, whether you were using your own personal savings or getting a loan, my sort of caveat piece of unasked for advice on that would be some really good advice that I got from um, a mentor early on, which was have a real handle on your needs versus your wants. And before you talk to any salesperson, because people are going to come at you with point of sale systems and all sorts of things that you will be completely convinced that you need to have to start out. But if you have a really good idea beforehand of what's in your need column and what's in your want column, you can focus on the need column first. And once you have sales, start buying the want items. Um, so whether that's your money or someone else's money, but as far as getting someone else's money, um, there are plenty of individual investors around, which I have heard from business peers have had some really good success that way. Um, there are also, I mean, there's, of course, the bank option, but I would definitely start with the Small Business Association because uh, there are some really creative options there. I remember us driving to Atlanta to get the most affordable bakery case in the entire southeast. Mm -hmm. off of Craigslist Atlanta. It's still there. It's the one we have in the bakery. In order to get to be as frugal as possible. Mm -hmm. Any, anyone else? Uh-oh. <laughs> Mom? <laughs> Don't be scared. I'm thinking back when you started. You were 26, very attractive young girl. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And you still are. But you had two issues dealing with like vendors and people who might not have taken you real seriously, and you had to get a handle on that early on. And how did you sort of manage that? You know? Can you recap that? So I can recap this. <laughs> so it started with a statement that when you were 26, you were young and attractive, <laughs> starting a business. Star. Star. Now still I'm attractive. I'm a hag now. Oh, no. <laughs> now still attractive. There, um, the. Guest remembers you having some difficulty with certain people in business, vendors, mm -hmm. um, taking you seriously because of your age and looks and maybe even the nature of the business. Talk a little bit about that. I actually like that you added that because I think that a lot could be added to the nature of the business. Um, honestly, if I were a vendor or other professional, I'm really not sure how much credence I would have given to this 26-year-old with clearly no experience opening a bakery 
in the middle of a recession, right when flour prices had just doubled. I um, actually have that newspaper clipping. Um, I would definitely say we had to grow into some of that. And it is a little bit of a double-edged sword. So part of me feels like while there were some obstacles there with being seen as a professional, and I can say this with a straight face while wearing a pie hat right now at the <laughs> age of 32, um, I don't think you can have it both ways. There were clearly some advantages that I got for being a cute, inexperienced 26-year-old with a bakery. It was adorable. Um, and I think it made it easy for people to actually overlook some of the things like selling out early. And I mean, in some ways, I think we were a group of people that, you know, people wanted to root for because, dang, it's like, bless their hearts. They just don't know what they're doing. I mean, kind of, I think there was a little bit of sympathy there um, that, you know, had the sort of the opposite side of that was not being seen as very professional. Um, I will say, as we have developed as a business, it really hasn't been as much of an issue. Um, you know, the only, I'm never really aware of myself as a female business owner. I don't really think of myself that way. And maybe it's my experience. I mean, I went to St. Mary's here in town for 14 years. And there was certainly, I mean, we were taught from an incredibly early age that you know, A, it wasn't a free pass being a woman, and B, it also wasn't a handicap. It just wasn't an issue. Um, so I think in some ways, I've just never even seen it as an obstacle to be overcome. Um, the only areas, yeah, we're sort of establishing some early on vendor relations, and I do think that had a lot more with my being 26. You know, it had more to do with that uh, than being a girl. Um, but yeah, as we've continued, really haven't, haven't encountered as much of that. I have tried to be sensitive to the fact that, you know, I wear, I wear a pie hat out in public. I frequently have brightly colored hair. I'm certainly marketing on, you know, an image of, you know, it's lots of fun. It's, I don't post pictures on Instagram of me, like, you know, stress crying while doing laundry, you know, the stuff that Thomas sees. Like, I'm not posting that everywhere. Um, so post you post those. Oh, that's good to know. So y'all should be following Thomas on Instagram and Twitter. Um, so yeah, I, just, I think that anything, whichever one of those is the strength, there's going to be an associated weakness. And just knowing that going in and not taking it personally is important. Let's see, we have someone new, and then can we come back to you? I think y'all both raised your hand at the same time. Me? Yes. Okay. <laughs> All right. As a 26-year-old starting, so you establish the bread baking. What then? <laughs> what was the next direction? You know, is it the thing? Um, right now, I need to think of how I'm going to pay for that. <laughs> So the question is, you knew early on that you had a skill of baking. Gift. A gift. <laughs> uh, the gift of being a good baker. Um, what did you prioritize next as you moved forward? And examples of how are you going to pay for it? How do you advertise your product? Where do you even begin? OK. First, a moment of clarity. I don't think I have ever realized that I have a particular skill or gift for baking. My real skill is relentless trial and error, sheer stubbornness. Um, Y'all would not believe the amount of stuff that does not work out. Um, with that said, establishing the foundation of what I'm going to be doing. So moving on to sort of the ne those next questions of, so how am I going to do it? It seems like a million years ago. Um, but I think the very first thing was simply making the commitment to do it. So yeah, did, did some of the business reading, realizing how much I didn't know. But it wasn't really real until I signed a lease. 
because at that point, that was the only debt that I had at that point. And while some people may say, well, a lease isn't really debt, I was signing a personal guarantee that even if this thing failed in six months, like what if they couldn't find a renter? I would still be on the hook for the duration of the lease. So that weight certainly spurred all of the other things. So kind of going back to your question earlier about the financing, whether you do it entirely from personal savings or you get funded, I think once you've decided what it is you want to do and you've established that there are some people out there who are interested in paying for it, I think the number one thing to do is figure out an approximate amount of money that you're working with. Because that is going to, I mean, it's so practical, it's not sexy, but it's going to determine so many of your decisions. And I would also say have as much of your own personal skin in the game as possible. Because that makes it really real. I mean, I think looking back on that lease document, you can, I mean, my signature, there are things where you can see that my hand was absolutely shaking. My voice is shaking right now, just remembering. And at that point, decisions had to be made and they were going to get made because they had to be made. Because every moment that we weren't open was money that I was, you know, paying into something that wasn't real. So figuring out Figuring out your where, because real estate, location, 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 it's everything. Figure out where it's going to be and figure out an approximate budget. You can always change it later as factors change, but I think that spurs you to really make some real decisions. What was your question? Okay, the question is, how much free publicity did you get before you opened? And then what have you done since? Have you hired a PR person to help maintain that publicity? Or what have you done since? Okay, question one, before we opened, not a lot. Uh, we actually were published, when we got our business license, we were mispublished not once but twice, even with our business name in the listings um, as Muddy's Break Shop <laughs> and my favorite, Muddy's Bait Shop, because everyone buys their bait on Sanderlin Avenue, obviously. <laughs> um, so yeah, we weren't really getting a lot of calls from that. Um, I will say Jennifer Chandler was, she's a food writer here in town, has some cookbooks out. Um, she had found me, she was one of the friends of a friend who had yeah, she had actually found me beforehand and was a, was a client when I was doing it, um, you know, underground in my kitchen. So she knew that I was opening something, and she wrote a piece. Uh, she came and visited the bakery while we were still in the build-out phase to write the piece, and it was published about a month after we opened. So that was probably the earliest publicity that we got. Uh, there really was not, there was not a fanfare or anything um, right then when we opened. It, was just, it wasn't on anybody's radar. Um, you know, we did get a good bit of publicity after we opened. And I think after, everybody was kind of like, oh, oh my gosh, I mean, who, who knew uh, that this would possibly happen? And we've had, we've been gifted with excellent publicity since then. Um, we've been very, very blessed by the Memphis, uh, Memphis media. As far as currently, I am our PR person. So... In one sense, no, we have not hired a PR person. In another sense, going back to Thomas's earlier question about how my role has changed, that's certainly part of my role. Um, I'm looking at it a little bit more intentionally. Um, the advice that I can give for folks looking for publicity is be nice to people. Um, it seems so simple, but it really is, I think, as easy as that. I mean, I am blessed in having, I have a very photogenic product. You know, it looks nice in a picture. But tips I can give people, take a little extra care. Um, you know, if you know that a reporter is coming to visit you, be prompt. Don't keep them waiting. Uh, be respectful of their time. Uh, people in the Memphis media, especially the print media right now, are juggling so many different jobs. There have been so many layoffs. 
all of the writers here in Memphis are covering so much more than they were covering five years ago. So just being respectful of their time is hugely important. Um, you know, taking a little extra care to go ahead and think about if a photographer is coming, what they might want to get a photo of and have as much of it ready as possible. Again, you know, the photographers, just like the reporters, are booked so solid at this point. Um, and then I will give advice that my mother always gave to me, and that is write a thank you note. Um, they're, they're taking time. They, don't, they can write about anybody. Um, they can have anybody come into their morning show. There are going to constantly be new options. And it's, it's the smart thing to do. It's also the civil thing to do. Somebody just gave you an opportunity. Um, you know, it takes five seconds to write a nice thank you note. And I think it goes a really long way. And just, you know, it's going to make their day. So that was some advice on the PR, PR question. <laughs> um, you mentioned that today you have a big list of mentors and friends that you checked in with. When you started, though, other than your friends and family and the librarians at the State Library, <laughs> who was kind of on your team as you were in the planning stage? Who may, so now you have all of these great mentors. Who was your original team? when you started planning and when you were putting it all together before you had a chance to meet these other business owners through, through your business? Uh, I think you said except for family, but I'm going to put them in there anyway because that's, that's really who I had. That was my team. That was who was keeping me sane, giving me advice, everything. Um, you know, I said it was parents, brothers, Thomas. I mean, everyone was doing their full-time job and acting as my cashier, my assistant baker at three o'clock in the morning, and my advice column, my own personal advice column. Um, so definitely staying in tune with that. Also, I mean, don't hesitate to just ask some customers. I mean, I had customers and some of them have become dear, dear friends now that, I mean, we get together outside of the business. Um, but, you know, you'll have customers that have their own business. So. That's a real, I mean, that's a sitting duck right there. They're coming to you. Do not hesitate. Just put them on your radar and snatch them up. Um, I definitely, I reached out to some other bakers at the time, you know, sort of my bakery crushes at the moment. And I will say, I really didn't hear back from anybody. So don't let that discourage you either. You know, if you're reaching out to some people that you really admire and you don't hear back, keep in mind, you're probably reaching out to them like Thomas said, because they're busy and because they are successful. So again, talking about kind of respecting people's time, like don't take it super personally. I was really discouraged by that and I really shouldn't have been because now I'm on the other side of it. I'm like, oh my gosh, I completely understand. I was, you know, this like rube from Memphis asking these questions and, you know, they're just doing their best to stay above water. Um, so, I mean, I'm thinking as I sort of developed those business friends, a lot of it early on was just, taking advantage of who I knew. So like Thomas's boss at MIFA, Sally Hines, totally fantastic. I completely took advantage of, you know, my relationship here because I really admired. He would come home talking about how great his work environment was and, you know, how effective their team was. And so I was just, you know, like, all right, I'm going to shamelessly use this to my advantage and try to get a coffee date with Sally and develop that a little bit. And that's been, you know, a wonderful friendship that's developed. So don't, you know, just look look close to home to start out because a lot of those people are just right in your backyard. I think we have time for one more question. I have a question. So when you started, there weren't other, I don't remember any because I don't even know. I don't know if you're familiar with it. But I've noticed that there's other cupcake kind of places, baker kind of places around. And I'm wondering, have you changed your strategy at all because they're around? What do you do when you Kathy with the hard hitting. So questions. a loyal, so a. Oh gosh, we're out of time. No. <laughs> so a loyal customer who has only eaten your baked goods noticed that when you opened, there was much less competition in your arena than there is now. Describe how you have changed or what has been different now that that's the case. Is that, is that good? Okay. That is a true statement. And I think as a type A eldest child, it can be very easy 
to make it all about me. And um, it can be very, very easy to feel like, oh yeah, you're gonna let me get in and prove that it can be done, do all of the heavy lifting here and then come along. And like that's just, a, that's a completely unfair attitude to have. And I think as human beings, it's probably a lot of our first impulse is to think along those lines. Um, but then when I, you know, take a second and, you know, as my priest says, calm down and grow up, um, you can look at it as it has actually been really healthy for my business as well as for other people's businesses. You know, ultimately, Memphis is still a small enough town that a high tide raises all boats. And we have a really strong food community here that is incredibly cooperative and with really great, it's very relationship-based. Shouldn't be a surprise for anyone here from Memphis. Memphis is relationship-based. Um, but that food community, it is less about competitors and more about partners. You know, if one of you is doing well, chances are you're all going to be doing well. Um, as for how it's sort of changed our strategy, I will be totally frank and admit, I mean, the minute any place opens in the tri-state area, I am I'm sure it's a huge shock, like super drama. Oh my gosh, what is this going to mean? What is this going to do? And kind of have to be, you know, immediately calm down and like, all right, just again, take a chill pill. And I got some really great advice um, from a super cute boy that I happen to know who typically has some pretty good advice. And I've really tried to keep that in mind over the last couple of years, you know, as more competition has developed. And he has done a great job of reminding me that I worked my butt off when we were the only game in town, simply to beat my own record. You know, Muddy's has a history, and it is one of our core values, is constant learning and improvement. Uh, I think that comes from my time at St. Mary's. It also comes a lot from my family of bettering oneself simply to be better, regardless of, you know, the competition or who else is in the room. Um, you know, that is a motivating factor in and of itself. And Thomas does a really great job of reminding me that, you know, work that hard with, you know, when I felt like I was the only one in the race. So why get super anxious and make a whole lot of changes based on what other people are doing? Essentially just keep that, keep that up because I'm not trying to be the number one bakery in town for the rest of time. I need to be the number one muddies. And there may be a time, um, you know, we have some things that are really important to us, like being closed on Sundays. That is something that is really core to our culture, and it is something I feel very strongly about. And if I'm going to be basing all of my decisions on what a competitor is doing, I'm going to lose that, and I'm going to lose something really, really important to us. So I think balancing strategic changes based on is this what's right for us, not is this what everybody else is doing. Um, at the same time, you know, you do have to stay at least in tune. You know, if your customers are really asking for a particular product or something. That's something to certainly pay attention to. Um, but I think remembering we're, we're going to be our best competition, and that's going to be the best way for us to measure how we're doing on that. Are we the best muddies that we can be? Because if we are, then it doesn't really matter what the other people are doing. There's plenty of business here in town. Um, if we're serving our customers right and we're making good decisions for our staff, I think we're going to be in a pretty good place. Well, thank you. Thank y'all. <laughs> Yay.